或摩达语，轻敌，轻敌，吉桑，五宝。Lao Tzu wrote that there is no greater mishap than to underestimate one's foe. Further, we could say that the agility of our opponent endangers what we hold dear. That the Ability of our opponent to move quickly. It's the ability of our opponent to outmaneuver us that causes us trouble. That we underestimate our opponent in what he can get done, and we underestimate our opponent in how fast he can move and how quickly we can move to counter him. We certainly face a great. Many opponents in the pig business. They don't all look like Tenniel's Jabberwock, but certainly they're ugly enough. And the damage that they can do to us is quite substantial at times. We ought to be quite careful not to underestimate what the Jabberwocks of the pig industry can do to us. The various disease processes and What they can do to the animals, and what they can do to our profitability and our sense of well-being, is very significant at times. We should not underestimate that. We should further not it underestimate their ability to move against us, to move faster than we can move. Is the way that they often get the best of us is simply they are moving while we're asleep. We say that. Rust never sleeps, and likewise, the disease processes—they don't sleep. We sleep, but they don't. We have certain weapons that we can use against these enemies, and we need to be skilled in their use as well as skilled in understanding what our opponents are up to and what their abilities are. Now, David was king in ancient Israel. Several hundred years before Lauza, he encountered a great many troubles, and he wrote fairly late in his life. He said, "Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me." As a young man, as a shepherd boy, David encountered a giant, David and Goliath, which is. Classical for its representation of a small person encountering a great foe. Goliath was a giant, and he challenged Israel as a champion. Someone come out and defeat me, and if you beat me, we'll just give up. Of course, they didn't expect that anybody would be willing to challenge Goliath, but. David, as a young shepherd boy, he had some experience, and he used a sling—not a slingshot, but a sling. Goliath was coming out with his giant-sized spear that he could impale David on this thing, but David came out with his sling that he could reach the giant before the giant could ever get close to him. David could toss his Rock from his sling, he picked up five smooth stones from the river, and he tossed one of them at the giant's head, and it sank into his forehead and knocked him out. And David took the giant's sword and beheaded him and won the battle. The outcome was that the giant lost to this. Bright young man who understood the situation, Malcolm Gladwell, a popular author in a recent book on David and Goliath, wrote, "The powerful are not as powerful as they seem, nor are the weak as weak. It's not so much the strength that we seem to have as our ability to manipulate." And outmaneuver the opponent. It's the understanding of our opponent that makes the difference in winning the battle. 
The process is something like this. The first step is that we observe, that we gather information about the situation. The next step is that we orient ourselves, we analyze the information that we have. The third step is that we adapt a plan. And the fourth step is that we execute that plan. Now, in the process of dealing with a pig disease, observations might be the history of the situation, what the pigs are telling us, what we can learn from diagnostic work, from blood work, from necropsy, from laboratory diagnosis. We gather all the information that we can get. We take this information and we analyze it. We analyze the information. Some of the information is useful. Some of it is no use. We just simply disregard the not useful information and we take the useful information and put it together to get some understanding of what is happening and we adapt a plan, something that we could do to stop this situation. And then finally, we execute the plan. This is a stepwise process. Now, there was a fighter pilot who was in the United States Air Force in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. He became a teacher. His name was John Boyd, and he is famous and popular these days for taking this static representation of observation, orientation, decision, and action, and turning it into a loop system that this system is dynamic, not static. It is not a matter of simply going through the loop one time. He said, you go through this loop over and over again. And he was a fighter pilot. And a fighter pilot, you're up there in an airplane against another fellow who is in another jet airplane and is trying to shoot you down and kill you. And you have got to be smarter and outmaneuver him. It's the outmaneuvering of your opponent that makes the difference. It's not how big your guns are or how fast your plane is, although these things are indeed certainly useful. The maneuverability of your plane is probably more important than the amount of power that you have. Your ability to be light, the ching in ching di, the lightness is quite often what it takes to win the battle. So first we make the observations of the situation. We orient ourselves to what is going on. We analyze the information. We reach a decision and we take an action. And then we observe what is the result of that action. We reorient ourselves. We make another decision. We make another action. Then we observe and orient, decide, and act over and over again dynamically until the battle is won. Now, if we can get inside the opponent's OODA loop, as Boyd said, if you can get inside your opponent's OODA loop, it, it seems like the other guy is moving in slow motion. He can't maneuver himself fast enough to compensate for the rapid maneuvering that you're making because you're outthinking him. And this is what we have to do in disease situations, is we have to move faster than the bacteria and the viruses and the disease processes. We have to move faster than they do. If we move faster than they do, we can beat them every time. Let us consider the example of the PERS virus. Now, the PERS virus has been around about 30 years now. We have been dealing with this virus since it emerged in Europe and North America in the 1980s, the virus makes its living by changing itself 
It's an RNA virus, and RNA viruses are naturally sloppy in their replication. When they make copies of themselves, they are likely to introduce some errors. Some of these copies are what you might consider to be lucky copies, and most of the errors are of no value at all to the to the virus, and those viruses that have fatal errors will die and uh, and disappear. But some of the viruses that have errors that allow it to disguise itself whenever it makes a copy of itself, if it's not perfect enough, and the virus is able to make jumps in its structure from one variant to another variant, these variant strains will start to emerge and to proliferate and overcome the immunity that will outmaneuver the immune system. It's the lightness, it's the chingness of these viruses that allow them to outmaneuver the pig's immune system and get ahead of us. If we would consider the situation in China today, most of the PERS viruses that we are dealing with are in the lineage 1 group. Rather specifically, they are in the NADC30-like group. Here we have the NADC30 virus, and the other viruses that are in the NADC30-like group are causing most of the PERS disease that we have in China today. And in fact, these are responsible for most of the serious PERS that's causing problems in the pig industry uh, in China and in North America as well. Most of these that are causing serious problems belong to what we call the lineage one of the PERS virus. Now, If we consider the vaccines that are being used, most of the vaccines that are being used are several years old because of the way that the bureaucracy of vaccine development works. It takes several years and lots of money to get a vaccine into the market. And so the vaccines that we have are in this group here. The the XJU1 is representative of the so-called high pathogenicity PERS, or what some people call Chinese PERS. CH1A is another member of this sort of group, that it it is an old variety of the PERS virus, not very much like the NADC30 that we are dealing with at all. And the more popular vaccines have the big sales teams behind them are the ones like VR2332, which there is many millions of doses of this vaccine are put into pigs every year. And all of these are very, very different. PERS virus says maneuvered himself away from these vaccines. The PERS virus has been maneuvering himself away uh, every day, every week, every month, every year. There are many new variants of the PERS virus coming out, but very, very few new variants of the vaccine. In fact, in China, no new variant uh, strains of the vaccine have come out for many years. The NADC30 like group was introduced into China about 2013. But the vaccines that we are using in China presently are in the order of 20 to almost 20 to more than 20 years old. We're looking at putting a 20-year-old vaccine system up against a modern problem, against a problem that is changing every day. Since 2013, there have been many, many variants of the NADC30 group realized in the Chinese industry, and there are new ones that are being created 
day after day that this virus is continuing to make antigenic jumps, it moves itself away from the immunity that exists in the herd, and this is the way that it makes a living, by changing itself. It is outmaneuvering the industry in that it is able to change itself very rapidly. The virus is constantly changing its light on its feet, and the industry is heavy and mired in a slew of bureaucracy, unable to move itself to compensate for the changes that this virus is making. Now, there are in some countries vaccines that are available against the so-called Lineage 1 PERS virus. And in the U.S., they have one one of the choices that it's available in the U.S. against the Lineage 1 PERS virus. And certainly, if you take a look at where the Lineage 1 group is and what the other possibilities are for use in the, U- in the U.S., certainly this vaccine would seem to be a far better choice than some of the others that uh, they have available there. And is it's much more likely to match up and much more likely to uh, be neutralizing against the PERS virus than some of these older models that are pretty long in the tooth now. With the system that we have for making PERS vaccines and introducing them into the industry, by the time they get them through the process of manufacturing and approval and attenuation and all the things, all the hoops, all the regulations that they have to go through to get these vaccines out into the market, by the time they are able to market the vaccine, they are too old to use. The virus has already moved away from them and is standing over by a tree somewhere laughing laughing at them as they're going and running off with their with their needles and syringes going after him and he's moved completely out of their way but so by the time that the vaccine is uh, has been made it's too old to use so we have to be much more agile than the virus we have to be much more ching we have to be more ching di than our enemy is Ching Di, otherwise we're going to underestimate him, Ching Di, and we're not going to get anything done. And some people say, well, this is the only thing that we've got that we can use. This is the only vaccine that we have. And it's like the guy who says that every problem looks like a nail whenever your only tool is a hammer. He's a Birmingham screwdriver. It's a hammer. Hopefully, there's no real problem that you're creating. With these modified live vaccines, however, the problem is that these vaccines are not safe. They're going to mix with the virus that's there on the farm, and you're going to get new variants that have got pieces of the vaccine in them. This is not getting us anywhere at all, and we need to take a look at what we're doing and look at uh, some ways to get away from the bureaucracy and the uh, rather circular thinking that has got us into this deep hole that we're in with this PERS virus. We are very much in a battle with these viruses, with these diseases, and we have to move faster than they do if we're going to beat them. It means that we have to be effective, and effective is dependent upon our organizational climate. That bureaucracy is the enemy of effectiveness. Bureaucracy is like a slime that slows you down and interferes with your ability to get things done. Of course, we need safety. Of course, we need protection. Of course, we need some regulation. But the regulation is not more important than what we're there to get done. What we're there to get done is to stop the disease. The regulation is secondary to the mission at hand. Dr. Boyd listed a number of things that needed to be considered in making an organization effective. And he called upon some of the words that were used, some of the ideas of the great German thinkers in the matter of war, 
and some of the great Chinese and other thinkers in the matter of war. And the first one is this issue of unity and mutual trust, what he called Einheit, was the oneness. Ein is one, height is ness, oneness, the unity in the group, the mutual trust. Now, we don't understand how important trust is until we find that it's not there. We have to all believe in one another. We have to all be working together and pulling together. And it's not a matter of simply one guy being totally in control and pushing everybody to, in, to submit to his will. It's not a matter of submission. It's a matter of consensus. Einheit is consensus, not necessarily submission. The next thing is we have to have people with intuitive competence. Now, the typically this is in the leadership. The vision is in the head, and we have to have intuitive competence in the leadership that somebody has got to be able to look at the situation and in a moment's glance decide what's going on. This is the finger spitzen Gefühl, and my German is terrible, it's as bad as my Chinese, but we get the idea that this is the feel on your fingertips, the fingertip feel, the fingertip sensitivity to what's going on, that you have got to get to the point that you can look at the pigs and understand what what is going on. A pig man is as good as his eye. Somebody has got to go out and take a look at the pigs and see what's going on. Also, we need the attitude of a mission orientation. We can find some of this in some of the writings of Juga Liang. We can find about the mission orientation the idea that the mission that we are there to do is more important than the way that we do things, that we might actually need to break some of the rules or to change the rules in order to get things done. And then finally, the focus and direction. We can't do everything. We can't be everywhere, but we can focus our resources on the things that are important. This is the basis of the hazard analysis and critical control point system. Organizations that embody these four characteristics will be capable of outmaneuvering. Now here's Louds again, this outmaneuvering, it's the chingness, the lightness, the quickness on our feet. It's the internal simplicity that permits quick adaptability. It's the, the car is light and it can move quickly like the flowing of the river. The car can move out of the way, can change itself, can change its direction just like the just like the, the, the flowing of the river, it can go where it needs to uh, with simplicity, quick adaptability. You can float like a butterfly and sting like a bee.